Um, well, first of all, thank you to Susie for the invitation. Um, my name is Andy May from the Darsbury Laboratory, um, and I'm going to talk about the new vertical test facility, uh, which we've commissioned for high beta uh, superconducting RF cavity qualification. Uh, so to start off, um, really important to emphasize that this project is the result of a lot of hard work by a very large group of people. Um, this photo is just some of the people in the superconducting RF lab team. Um, for a bit of context, for those that aren't familiar with superconducting RF um, for accelerators, just to give a bit of context, um, there are various stages, obviously, to get us from, from an initial design through to accelerator operations, and all of these stages, obviously, are a, a huge amount of work. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to give a fairly sort of um, summary review of the stages, but just kind of for context. So we begin with uh, EM modeling um, of the superconducting RF structure using finite element codes. Um, we then progress to obviously a manufacturing, um, in, uh, in this case, bulk niobium. Um, the images in these next few slides aren't all from the same accelerator project, but they were just the best images to show the different stages. So after the manufacture of the cavity, um, we then move on to bare cavity testing. So in this case, the superconducting structures are immersed in superfluid helium, um, and they are they're tested um, just as the bare cavity structure. Once they've been qualified as bare cavities, they're then jacketed. So this involves the welding of the helium can onto the structure. Um, in the case of some projects, there's also a cold magnetic shield that's assembled at this stage as well. Once they've been jacketed, um, they are then installed into the cryo modules, um, which obviously is a hugely complex process in and of itself. Um, and then you do then high power RF testing of the cavities within the cryo module. Um, and you can see here on the right hand side, the test bunker and CA Sackler, which they used for the um, the qualification of the uh, the medium beta cryo module prototype. Um, once it's past that stage, it then of course moves to installation into the accelerator tunnel. Uh, this is from the flash Lunac at Daisy, um, and this obviously is when you can then begin accelerator operations properly. So the work that we're doing at the moment is part of the European Spallation Source project. So the ESS is a, a proton Lunac um, delivering protons to a, a heavy metal target. Uh, tungsten, which then allows you to produce spallated neutrons out of the back of the target. Um, and that's then delivered to a range of beam lines. Uh, here you can see on the right hand side of the image, um, which is used for a whole, a whole range of different science. So this block diagram here shows uh, the structure of the ESS LINAC. So you have these orange blocks, first of all, which are the, uh, the low energy normal conducting structures. Um, that gets you as far as 78 mega electron volts of beam energy. You then enter this blue block here, which is the first superconducting section of the accelerator. So these spoke cavities then take you up to 200 MeV. Uh, you then have the medium beta section of the accelerator. So beta is uh, the velocity of the protons over the speed of light. So you get through the medium beta structure um, and that gets you up to eight, uh, sorry, 628 MeV of beam energy. You then move on to the high beta section of the accelerator. Um, and this is the bit that we're very heavily involved in in, in our project in the surf lab. Um, and what we're responsible for is the manufacture and the qualification of 84 high beta superconducting RF cavities for this section of the LUNAC. Um, and that will get our beam energy then up to 2,500 MeV, which is then delivered um, through the high energy beam transport and then ultimately onto target. And you can see at the bottom of the slide here, this is an artist's impression of, uh, this is obviously a building site at the moment, but this is what the ESS facility will look like. Um, so on the, on the top left here, you can see um, this is the ESS high beta cavity. So it's a five cell structure. Um, and you can see then in the bottom left, once it's jacketed, this is the helium vessel that will surround it. Um, and these cavities are then installed into the, uh, the high beta uh, cryo modules. Uh, there'll be 21 of these cryo modules, um, each housing four cavities, as you can see, and that gives us our, our, our 84 cavities for the LINAC. Uh, the nominal accelerating gradient of these cavities uh, is, is when they're qualified will be at least 19.9 megavolts per meter, uh, operating with a Q value of at least five times 10 to the nine. So in terms of developing a test facility for these cavities, so after they've been um, delivered to us by the manufacturer, they obviously need to be qualified before we can install them into the cryo modules. Um, and so we then have to develop uh, the design requirements for the vertical test facility. So our cavity frequency of 704 megahertz, this gives us the, the geometry of the cavity and then the, the dimensions. The operating temperature for the cavities is two Kelvin. Um, and so then that obviously gives the requirement of superfluid helium. We have, as I say, uh, 84 cavities to test. And um, from experience on previous projects, uh, primarily the XFL project, we estimate uh, a rework rate of around 30%. So 
So of the cavities that are delivered to us, on the order of 30% of them won't meet the, um, the, the accelerating gradient or the Q-spec on first test. And so they'll require some reprocessing, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, before they can then be tested again. And then if they meet spec, they'll, they'll obviously then have been qualified. And this gives us a, an anticipated total number of tests of 115. Given the time scale of the project, um, we have two years for these tests, and so therefore that translates to on the order of a cavity per week. Um, so that's the sort of throughput of the facility that we require. The uh, conventional VTF approach, um, which has been used successfully at a number of other labs, like DAISY, uh, CERN, Fermilab, et cetera, um, is to immerse the cavities in a bulk liquid helium bath. You then pump your helium bath down to 30 millibar to get to 2K. And then you can use a two Kelvin heat exchanger with a Joule Thompson valve to maintain a constant liquid helium level. And you can therefore sort of test indefinitely. This requires something on the order of seven and a half thousand liters of liquid helium uh, per test. And your gas handling system, so this includes your 2K heat exchanger, your pumping system, all the distribution pipe work, safety devices, uh, valves, and so on. Uh, they need to be sized for on the order of 20 grams per second. So, so very, very high throughput of helium in these kinds of systems. The, um, the alternative approach, which we developed at STFC, is to do what we call a horizontal vertical test facility. So in this case, the cavities are mounted horizontally and then st stacked vertically within the cryostat, as you can see on the right-hand side. Um, and so because you install them after they've been jacketed, you can actually fill the helium directly into the cavity jacket. And so by using a common fill line um, and then a header tank at the top here, uh, as long as that header tank is, is filled, then obviously the cavities will be immersed. So each jacket contains uh, 50 liters of helium. The overall cryostat has to be sized in order to accommodate this kind of configuration. Uh, one of the advantages of this approach is that because the cavities are installed horizontally, they're actually operating in a closer um, um, manner to the configuration they will have in the Linux. Doing this, we can test three cavities per cooldown, and it requires on the order of 1500 liters per test compared to um, 7,500 in, in the conventional approach. And the uh, flow rate of helium through the system in the steady state under static loading is less than two grams per second um, compared to on the order of 20 grams per second in the conventional approach. And they have uh, independent cavity pumping lines as well. So the, uh, the beam vacuum inside the cavities is pumped independently for the three cavities. Um, so this shows a CAD model of the facility we've developed. Um, and so the idea is to design around what we call a cavity support insert or a CSI. And so by designing two of these, um, you can have one under test uh, whilst the other one is being prepared with the next set of cavities uh, to be tested, just to increase the throughput of the plant. Um, the total volume of helium in the system is uh, just less than 450 liters um, to do a single fill. Uh, and you can see there the, uh, the cryostat volume and the two Kelvin valve box, which is used to distribute cryogens through the, the different circuits of the system. Um, apologies for this slide, it's a little bit messy, but it just it gives you kind of an idea of um, the architecture of the system. So we have an air liquid Halal ML cryoplant, uh, which is shown on the right hand side, which provides us liquid helium at 4K and, and cold helium gas at 50K. Um, it's obviously stored in a dewer and then transferred through the two Kelvin valve box into the cryostat on the left. Um, and this is uh, pumped on using at the moment one, but we are currently commissioning a second set uh, of, of 2K pumps, which give you your 30 millibar. Um, and all of that helium is then sent through a recovery system and then reliquified. Um, so it's a completely closed cycle system. Um, obviously, with any facility like this, a huge amount of effort needs to be spent to, uh, looking at the safety issues associated with it. So our worst case failure scenarios for the cryostat were considered to be um, the cryostat vacuum failure. So this is a failure of the insulation vacuum of the cryostat whilst we're at the 2K. Um, an alternative uh, failure scenario would be beam pipe vacuum failure. So this would be one of the UHV lines to the cavity vacuum failing. Um, or a third failure scenario that we considered in, in quite a lot of detail would be contamination of the helium circuit. So that first uh, failure scenario where we have the insulation vacuum fail uh, would result in immediately 300, K, uh, 300 Kelvin air impinging onto the cold surfaces of the cavities and obviously the associated heat load onto the helium uh, that that would give. So we, we looked at the, um, the effective heat load you would get with, with your bare cavity jackets versus with the MLI. And it turns out that actually the MLI is very, very effective at retarding the heat transfer from warm gas onto the cold surfaces. Um, and so this, this approach managed to um, significantly reduce the size of the safety devices required because the, the heat loading would be so much less. 
the second one that I mentioned, this, this beam pipe vacuum failure. So in this case, if we had um, one of the UHV lines fail, we would then have 300 K air going onto the inside surface of the cavity. Um, because they're the completely independent pumping lines, we considered it was extremely unlikely that all three uh, would fail simultaneously. Um, so if you just have a single line fail, um, then it turns out that even without any kind of um, heat transfer retardation on the inside of the cavity, it's still lower than the previous case. And therefore, this is not a limiting scenario. As I say, contamination of the helium circuit is a, a considerable concern. So we have um, obviously burst disk and various kind of um, permanent safety devices like that, as well as transient ones like uh, pressure relief valves. So the pressure relief valve on the helium circuit is shown uh, in this, this CAD model and in the photo on the right hand side. And so if this was to open uh, in response to some transient lo uh, loading event and then uh, fail to close again properly, you could have air ingress into the system. And of course, this would result in, in solid nitrogen forming and therefore you would have trapped volumes of helium. So in order to mitigate this, we designed this low pressure helium guard. So the idea is that you have a, a volume of helium around the area where the pressure relief valve would vent into. And so that way, if the valve doesn't close um, completely, then all that can happen is you can have room temperature helium um, getting back into the circuit and therefore that mitigates the risk of any blockages falling. Um, and of course, there's then a second pressure relief valve on the outside of that volume. So you have a sort of a double seal uh, approach. The, uh, the magnetic shielding was, was a big area of work as well. So um, if you have any, any trapped flux in, in the, the superconducting material of the cavities, then this can uh, degrade the performance, uh, primarily the Q. And so we, we have a, a sort of two-stage approach. So first of all, there's a room temperature um, passive magnetic shield which is mounted concentrically with the thermal shield of the cryostat. Uh, this is made from new metal and uh, using this approach, you can get field attenuation down below the level of 1.4 microtesla. And then to improve on that even further, we use these two coils. Um, so one at the top and one at the bottom of, of the test stand. Um, and by tuning the current in these two coils, we've been able to attenuate the field even further. So below the level of one microtesla. Um, as I mentioned, the, the UHV lines uh, for inside the cavities, um, that required a huge amount of work as well. So uh, our vacuum group have developed this custom slow pump, slow vent system um, to allow us to operate the cavity vacuum down below the level of 10 to the minus seven millibar. And if you, if you vent the cavities for, for various kind of rework purposes, then it's vital not to introduce any contamination in that process. And so that was the, the, the justification for this, this slow pump, slow vent system. Uh, we use uh, residual gas analysis as well to uh, control any contamination. This is uh, the view from my office window. Um, so this shows the surf lab area where we've been doing this work. So on the left hand side, uh, we have obviously the bunker. So the testing of these cavities has the potential to produce uh, ionizing radiation in the form of x-rays. And so obviously um, concrete shielding is required to, to um, have, have personal protection. So the, uh, the test stand itself is actually submerged below ground level in that bunker. And then at, at ground level, we then have the two Kelvin uh, valve box, which as I say, controls the distribution of cryogens through the system. Those cryogens are supplied from the cryo plants, which you can see in the middle of the image. So we have a 3000 liter dewer, uh, which is then um, supplied with, with liquid helium from the 2K, uh, sorry, from the cold box rather behind. Um, the, the 2K pumps and so on are actually, so um, they're located in a separate building. And so that pipe work on the back wall, you can see goes to the building across the road, which is where we have all of the, the pumps and the recovery system. On the right hand side of the photo, you can see we have our uh, assembly stand. So we have space there for both inserts. So you can be preparing one whilst you're moving the other one. And this is where we actually mount the cavities on, onto the test stand. And then behind the assembly area, we have uh, the clean room and the high pressure rinse system, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. So I've, uh, I've got a quick video, uh, which hopefully we'll play, which just shows the, um, the procedure for taking the, um, the test stand with the assembled cavities uh, and moving it across into the bunker. So as, as I mentioned earlier, um, on the order of 30% of the cavities that are delivered um, will not meet spec in the first instance. Um, and so typically this is the result of some um, contamination on the inside, on, on the RF surface of the cavity. And so the way to treat this is to put it through a high pressure rinse procedure. So we have a, an ISO 4 clean room, uh, which we've, we've now commissioned for this. 
And uh, you can see there on the right hand side of the image, this high pressure rinse system. So we, we strip the cavity down and mount it uh, vertically onto that stand. And there's then a, a nozzle, which um, is then inserted through, through uh, one of the uh, beam ends of the cavity. And you can then uh, high pressure rinse the inside surface of that cavity and that, that stand rotates around to allow you to get even coverage on the inside of the cavity. Uh, we defined quite clearly these modes of operation uh, for taking for taking the, the CSI through operation. So we begin with mode one, where we actually assemble the cavities onto the cavity support insert. Um, and there's a series of checks we do at that stage. We then have the CSI loading and in the initial checks in the bunker. Um, so that was the video that you just saw of, of moving the CSI across into the bunker. Uh, mode three is when we actually begin cool down. So this is the cool down of the thermal shields and the cavities down to 40K using that cold gas from, from the first stage heat exchanger of the cryo plant. Uh, mode four then is the cavity cool down to four kelvins. This is the first time the cavities see liquid. We then have um, a series of RF, RF operations at 4.2K. Um, so these are fairly minimal tests, but it's things like insertion loss measurements at 4K. We then pump the cavities down to two kelvin um, in mode six. And then uh, mode seven, we then have the RF operations at 2K. Um, once the RF complete, uh, sorry, once the RF operations are completed, uh, we then move into mode eight and we warm back up to room temperature. And then mode nine is the CSI removal from the bunker. And then uh, mode 10 is when we then disassemble the cavities on the CSI. Um, and so you can see that there's actually, you can stagger these slightly so that you can have, uh, for example, mode eight and mode nine happening on one CSI. And actually you've already started mode two on the next CSI, which increases the, uh, the throughput of the, the whole facility. So we've carried out four cold runs so far. Um, so we began with run zero at the end of 2018. And this was the first cool down of, of the CSI. So this was without any installed cavities. And this was um, primarily to validate the baseline operation of, of the cryostat. Run one then um, was March through June of 2019, where we had our first prototype cavity, uh, P02, which was called in the middle cradle, as you can see in the photo there. Run two uh, was then July through August of 2019, where we took P02 and uh, ran it in the top cradle position. And the reason for doing this is because this is the, the worst position for a cavity to be producing radiation because of the line of sight out at the top of the bunker. And that then allowed us to carry out a comprehensive radiation survey um, for, for assurance there. Uh, run three then was at the end of, uh, sorry, the end of 2019, I should say. Um, this was uh, P02 and P01, which was the second uh, prototype cavity that we got from CA Sackley. Um, and this was to validate the slow pump, slow vent procedure, which we'd then done on P02, as well as validating that the CSI could operate with two cavities. Uh, the shield cooldown to 50K takes on the order of 36 hours. Um, so you can see there thermometers at various stages on the shield. And then cavity cooldown to 4.2K. Um, so the, uh, the thermometer in this case was actually placed at the bottom of the helium column. So you can see that goes to 4K very, very quickly. Um, and then it takes on the order of six hours to actually fill the entire CSI to the top of that header tank and provide us with a full inventory of helium. We then move down to 2K. Um, so this is when we run up the 2K pumps um, and you can then drop the pressure down uh, above the surface of the, the helium bath to below 30 millibar. This cools you through the lambda point. Um, the helium undergoes a phase transition to superfluid and we can then operate below 2.2K. We've been able to demonstrate really excellent pressure and temperature stability with this facility. So by running a uh, PID, a proportional integral derivative controller on the 2K pump speed, we've been able to demonstrate uh, pressure stability on the order of 0.1 millibar. Um, which corresponds to a temperature stability of plus minus one millikelvin. So very, very good uh, pressure and temperature stability. And in forthcoming runs, we're going to look at the level of stability we can maintain under dynamic loading. So this is when we actually start uh, putting RF power into the cavities. We also looked quite a lot at the response to loading. So this is um, the, the ability of the, the cryostat to deal with the additional um, power loading from introducing RF into the cavities. So this is actually uh, far more kind of aggressive power loading than we would ever actually see from, from the dissipation in the cavities. But we looked at a series of 40 second pulses um, stepping up to 200 watts. And you can see that even at 200 watts at 40 seconds, we were still able to maintain um, the system under the lambda point. So in terms of the cryo and the RF operations at 2K, um, what we do is we do a single shot fill procedure. So we fill all the way to the top of the, uh, the buffer volume at the top. Um, and that level can actually get down to 70% um, before um, there's any concern that the cavities aren't fully immersed. And so under the static loading of the system, uh, your hold time from 100% to 70% is at least 18 hours. 
the actual duration um, obviously for RF testing is less than this because as soon as you start dissipating RF power, of course, you're boiling off the helium faster. But even with um, sort of a, a very, very conservative um, consideration of the RF power dissipation, you've still got at least eight hours of hold time for RF operations. So you can do a full shift of RF test. In practice, what we've done um, is done a, a cryogenic top up first thing in the morning. It takes around two and a half hours with the current procedure. Um, and this then allows a full RF shift for the rest of the day. Um, so we can, we can do these tests daily when we're cold. We've done um, some measurements of the Q versus the accelerating gradients um, of P02 and then compared that with data that we've, we've got from, from a partner lab. Um, and so when we've seen complete agreement with an experimental error. So really, really great milestone there to demonstrate that the RF facility was able to do that. We also looked at the variation in Q with temperature. So the way this was done was by uh, sampling the Q, uh, to do low power RF measurements to sample the Q and then backing the 2K pump speed off. So that would allow the bulk temperature of the helium to drift. Um, and so by doing this, you're able to sort of sample um, at, some, at some frequency and then have then a plot of the Q versus the temperature. And you can see the, uh, the blue data points, so the temperature of the helium and the orange data points are the temperature of the cavity. Below the lambda points, um, obviously in the superfluid state, they're very, very uh, closely bounded. It's a very, very small delta T between the two. Um, once you get above 2.2, okay, of course, the thermal conductivity drops off and there is a greater temperature step. Um, but you can see that we've been able to measure the Q versus T quite effectively. Once all of those RF measurements are done, uh, we then obviously have to warm the cryostats up. And so we've developed this speedy warm up uh, procedure. And this works by uh, using a heater in, in the liquid column to actively boil off any remaining helium after the testing is finished. And we then use recirculation pumps to uh, drive warm helium gas through a variety of cooling circuits in the CSI to speed up the warm up, uh, rather than just relying on radiation and other parasitic loading. Uh, we then have around 72 hours using this procedure to get from finishing the RF operations to the cry start being at 300K. Uh, and so all considered together, this, this cryogenic performance appears more than consistent with our plan to test three cavities every two weeks. So that's, that's the throughput we're looking at for the facility. So in terms of future plans, um, the vertical test facility as a whole was, was put into uh, shutdown during, during the lockdown from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so we're currently in a recovery mode to, to get all the systems back online, which has been going really well so far. Um, we had a key milestone last week. So the first pre-series cavities, uh, H001 and H002 were delivered last week. So these are the first cavities that will actually uh, be installed into cryo modules and then eventually into the accelerator. Uh, we've done incoming inspections on these and they're gonna be loaded next week with a view to starting our next run, which is run four um, at the end of July. Um, and that will run through until the beginning of September, uh, allowing us to test both of these new cavities as well as doing some additional tests on P01. Uh, and we then expect to start our full testing program uh, later this year. So to summarize quickly, um, so we've developed this novel vertical test facility, uh, which is gonna allow us to test three superconducting RF cavities per run, uh, whilst using on the order of 70% less liquid helium than conventional facilities elsewhere. Uh, we've demonstrated the first cavity cool down to 2K uh, with really, really excellent pressure and temperature stability uh, using those PID controls on the pumps. Uh, the RF test data from P02 at 2 Kelvin is entirely consistent with the data from our collaborating labs. Um, and overall, the preliminary cryogenic performance of the facility uh, looks consistent with our plans to test three cavities on a, on a two weekly basis. Um, just a lot of people to thank, actually. So obviously the rest of the Surf Lab team, as well as our state management, our collaborators, uh, primarily from ESS, from CA and from INFN, uh, as well as a number of industrial partners that have collaborated with us on this. Um, thank you very much. I'd be really happy to take any questions.